have uh, two speakers, Suzanne Stewart-Steinberg, um, who is Professor of Comparative Literature uh, and Italian Studies and the director of the Pembroke Center. She's going to be speaking about reclamation. Gerhard Richter did not recently sell um, an abstract painting for over 30 million pounds, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> But that's okay, um, because he is chair of the Department of German Studies here um, at Brown, and we're glad to have him. And he will be speaking on inheritance. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I can hear myself because uh, I have this ear infection. So I'm not. Okay. Um, so um, the, my thinking about reclamation um, actually comes from a, a very concrete study of Italian fas uh, fascist uses of the term, and I've been working on um, uh, land reclamation in fascist Italy, and the, the, the challenge of making this into a political concept has been a really interesting process, and as uh, Amanda and I were talking at one, during one of the breaks, I now hate my concept, you know, so I'm <laughs> sick and tired of it. Um, um, but, uh, um, so I guess we were told to uh, talk a little bit about the etymolog etymology of it and then go on to how we use it. So reclamation in English, um, okay and in its earliest uses in the mid-15th century, referred to a revocation of claims on the land. It soon came to stand also for a legal appeal, therefore for the action of protesting. From this followed the idea of an action of claiming something back, form, something that was formerly in one's legal possession, or of reasserting a legal right. In a second meaning, reclamation signifies the reassertion of a relationship or connection with something, a re-evaluation of a term, a concept in a more positive way, as for instance, the reclamation of women's art heritage, including, for example, a re-evaluation of the low status accorded to activities characterized, for instance, as domestic crafts, etc. Again, the use of the term queer Marks um, a reclamation uh, um, is a um, sorry. Marks the reclamation of a term that had previously been used pejorative in English-speaking countries. Amir Mufti is critical of such endeavors. For him, some recent post-colonial work that has as its basis a recuperation or reclamation of the traditions of colonized lands and peoples succumb to the seductions and therefore the aura of authenticity. And he writes in this context, the hermeneutics of suspicion are abandoned for the hermeneutics of reclamation. In a third usage, reclamation describes the action, fact, or process of reforming a person morally and spiritually, the saving of a person from a way of life considered immoral or otherwise undesirable, and therefore, by extension, also the action of civilizing a people considered wild or savage. In its most common use, usage today, reclamation refers to the conversion of wasteland, especially of land previously underwater into land fit for use, cultivation, or construction. It may also indicate the recovery of waste products for reuse or recycling. Now, one thing that is really uh, no uh, noticeable is that English actually covers this broad spectrum of meanings, which it doesn't do in other Western languages where the separate words are actually used. The, the cognate reclamation, which in Italian would be reclamazione, simply does, is not a word, uh, oddly enough. Um, and French also divides this up. In German, it's Landnahme or um, But um, So English really is the only, as far as I know, covering all these terms. OK, now what I was going to do is um, I'm just going to put forward uh, eight, I think there are eight or nine theses uh, that I've developed around reclamation, and they are not, I don't think, in a necessary order, and they might also be wrong, but I'm working <laughs> with this, okay. All right, so my first thesis is that reclamation is a technique concept, insofar as it condenses within itself ekphrastic strategies and transformative drives, showing and telling an eternal present and a destiny. As a technique, reclamation does the work of yoking, yoke, does it come? Yeah. Uh, of yoking terms 
in such a way as to produce a technology of authenticity, just as it also produces an alibi for an authentic technology. Its mode of operation is that of the rhetoric of a chiasmus, and not that of a confusion between reality and fiction. And that would be Jim Scott's thesis and his influential seeing like a state. Nor can it be reduced to what Baudrillard famously calls the order of a simulacrum. More accurately, reclamation, I would say, mobilizes figure and ground, two terms that have been put to use in gestalt therapy, here we go, or psychology, as well as by media theorists such as Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan's famous The Medium is the Message postulates that the figure, the medium, operates through its context, the ground. The message which the medium conveys can only be understood if the medium and the environment in which the medium is used and which simultaneously it effectively crea creates are analyzed together. At the same time, the idea of figure also refers to the content of a particular medium, while ground refers to the medium itself. McLuhan's aphorism can thus be read as an attempt to draw attention away from a preoccupation with figure message to a consideration of the importance of ground medium. In light of this, I propose that the concept of reclamation as figure of the ground and as ground of the figure sits uncomfortably in the domain um, of the concept, indeed challenges conceptuality in significant ways, to the extent that it drains both the ground and the figure of their mutually supportive consistencies. Reclamation is materially close both to the land and all the ideological meanings it may and does evoke. In this sense, reclamation is conceptually unstable. The following are first thoughts then on how to think about the unstable materiality of grounds in conjunction with unstable concepts. Reclamation, hypothetically, furnishes such grounds for thinking. And therefore, as a first definition, I offer the following. Reclamation is the conceptual grasp of the mediatic image in the process of being drained of its grounds. So that's number one. Two, reclamation invokes nature, and this in particular through the, uh, its grounding in the land as a central element uh, of its operation. Nature is reclaimed for possession, use, and authenticity. And I'm really sorry that uh, Bashar is not here anymore. Um, nevertheless, the term produces a caesura in the concept of nature to the, to the degree that as reclamation, nature itself must of necessity be naturalized. As part of this logic, there exists a realm of nature that is more than itself, indeed an unnatural nature, one that therefore requires active intervention in order to bend it in the right direction. If Italian fascism, I'm going to be referring, you know, I'm going to have to necessity, you know, refer to uh, fascism as the example here, though of course there are other contexts in which reclamation works. If Italian fascism used the language to describe its project as one that would reclaim the authentic values of traditional rural life, it was nevertheless also the case that such a, reclama a reclamation was founded not only in opposition to unnatural and therefore perverse life in the cities subject to a frightening range of diseases. Sterility pertained not only to the pathological environment of urbanism, it had equally destructive origins in the death-bringing swamps. Uh, and this is uh, a, an example from a fascist from, from, the, from the period. In a 1929 article written by Lorenz, uh, Len, uh, Renzo Larco, for instance, we find that different from other nations, Italy had to make its post edenic geography by the sweat of its people's brow. He writes, it is a physically redeemed Italy that emerges from the submersion by the swamps, that acquires her other constructive dimensions of fecundity. The idea of Italy as the Edenic garden of the world is a mad idea. God demanded from us that we conquer her inch by inch through ardent labor." End quote. If the reclamation of marches became synonymous with fascist national regeneration, this was made possible by a process of formulating the idea of a fascist nature grafted upon but also supplementing a more primordial and destructive one. 
In such a vision, fascist nature was clean, healthy, and virile, while its primordial version was undifferentiated, malaria-infested, hence contagious, and subject to forces of permeability and invasion, and therefore, of course, also feminine. If at work were often simple binary oppositions, it was nevertheless also the case that equally at work were more subtle maneuvers that depended on strategies of displacement and supplementarity, whereby nature could signify in many often opposing directions. The idea of giving back the land to those who had earned or deserved it was in this sense a return of and to something that never before had existed. Therefore, Reclamation invokes nature while also denaturalizing it. This to the extent that it must depend on the grounds draining in the sense that authentication must rely on the ungrounding of the ground. Reclamation proposes the restorative in a language of the radically new. It proposes itself as revolutionary to the extent precisely that it invokes an authentic tradition. Thesis three. Reclamation articulates a theory of landscape. In its broadest definition, a landscape is a portion of land which the eye can comprehend at a glance. Pertinent here is to emphasize that applications of such a use, usage have wavered between the land itself and the picture of that land, and between a natural scenery and a political administrative unit. As a compound word, landscape yokes the land to escape. In its most general meaning, land signifies a defined, bounded space, while scape is etymologically related to shape and sheaf. Uh, by the way, the word in Italian for sheaf is fascio, which is where fascism comes from. I was going to run with that and decided not to um, <laughs> uh, when I discovered it. Well, okay. So while scape is etymologically related to shape and sheaf, rendering, therefore, the landscape into a collection or system of lands. Comprehended at a glance, it is thus, in John Jackson's words, a space deliberately created to speed up or slow down the process of nature. It is Jackson also to distinguish between political and inhabited landscapes, the first artificial, the second the result of a natural evolution. While the first comes about as the result of actions from above, the second develops from below. It is a vernacular art landscape. Jackson views vernacular landscapes as on the defensive, encroached upon by the imposition of political strategies of surveillance, mapping, and visualization. I propose that reclamation considerably complicates such binarisms in its making of landscapes to the extent that, it, that its work is both imposed from above and developed from the ground up. Reclamation builds the traditional, the authentic, the vernacular. Turning to Mussolini's integral reclamation, and in particular to the regime's architectural politics, fascism's famous Romanism, that is, its dedication to the return to an imperial past, was supplemented by ecological policies literally written in the ground. Uh, this is a cartoon from one of the newspapers done during the 30s. Again, this is, the, this is the shape of the fasces, right? And so this is the reclamation of land where the fasces is literally written in the ground. And this is, a, a, I'm sorry for the quality of the photo, but this, was, this is actually from today. It's outside of Rome, and you, there are Brazilian uh, pine trees that were planted to spell the word dux, you know, duce, leader, into the ground, and it's still visible as such today. So this is the literal writing of into the land. Uh, so, and, um, so literally written in the ground and by the recuperation of an Italian vernacular past. Italian architectural modernism, good example of this, uh, was predicated on both the idea of the tabula rasa or the ex novo, this is a suburb built in, um, under fascism, and on notions of space thoroughly soaked with meaning. If vernacular architecture as the architecture with ar without architects is a form of building and inhabiting a space that comes into being from the ground up, then in fascist Italy, this was built on the idea of the farmhouse. In Tuscany, Puglia, or even the native villages in the Italian colonies. Right, this is an example of a trullo. It's from um, um, a farmhouse in the south. Giuseppe, uh, and this is, was uh, in connection with uh, of the fascist um, exposition on rural architecture. 
Giuseppe Pagano, fascism's most important exponent of vernacularism, called for what he called an immense encyclopedia of abstract forms and creative expressions with obvious connections to the land, climate, economy, and technology, and this is his encyclopedia. It was the latter that would constitute both a vast reservoir of references while yet allowing for the creation of something radically new. His vernacular signs required paradoxically both, grounding in the rural earth and a radical unhinging from their context. If signs then, uh, then become the ground upon which to reclaim space and time, several consequences follow. First, the reclaimed landscape is inevitably figurative. In what Noah Stymatsky describes as the surge of the everyday, where the marginal, the quotidian, the local come to speak in a universal language, such language has a broad range of genres at its disposal. And this is something I'm very interested in but very unsure about. Stymatsky's study of Italian neorealist neo locations detects a landscape that speaks in the lyrical mode. Erich Auerbach's mingling of high and low and Bachtin's dialogical imagination and Fred Jameson's antinomies of realism have placed realism as the literary form closest to what I'm calling the logic of reclamation. That's a big statement and I'm not sure I no, believe it. Okay. In the Italian case, light, uh, late 19th century verismo and later neorealism gave rise to a specifically theatrical choral spin on the language of the land. Uh, this is uh, the Giovanni Verga, the writer, as a photographer. Um, and then here is um, at the theater. Uh, Mussolini built cities as stage sets, and this to the extent that such building enacted a dramaturgy um, of nature. Second, the reclaimed landscape is always already a map, and this reclamation affects two moves simultaneously. On the one hand, its mapping drive miniaturizes and simplifies, the terms of Jim Scott's, in such a way as to make possible local experimentation in order then to generalize. Yet this drive also approaches, uh, approaches Borges' fantasy of the exactitude of science when the map covers indeed becomes territory. Animated maps first appear during the first years of Reclamation's great successes, and they provide a fine example of these two forms of mapping. This is from Fritz Lang's M, which I learned is the first uh, animated map ever, okay, to appear in a film. Uh, thesis four. Reclamation is a theory of ruination and ruins. Given the centrality of redeemed landscapes in such projects, archaeological knowledge provides both temporal breadth and spatial depth to its grounding. On the one hand, reclamation does the work of memory, of rememoration, and as such, it is reconstructive and builds in the direction of integration and cohesion. Two such modes of operation are central. First, there are those archaeological practices that restore the past as a project of of authenticity. Second, yet, ruins pose a problem for the inhabited landscape of dwelling. The ruin cannot be a home, even while in its very monumentality it does authenticate a space and a history. Ruins, Noah Stymatsky writes, offer material evidence, proclaim the imperative of shelter, of housing. While ruins constitute sites of symbolic commemoration, they nevertheless resist a solid, definitive articulation. They emerge as an arena wherein a monumental thrust is traversed by a force of contingency. On the other hand, fascist archaeology tended to isolate uh, monuments, to detach them from their earlier historical contexts, this in the service of a distinction between the ancient and the merely old. The millennial monuments of our history must impose in their necessary solitude, Mussolini proclaimed. Uh, this is a, the futurist photographer, Filippo Mazzoero, and this is, of course, Rome. The Colosseum is right here. And this is uh, these, the monuments. This is Mussolini's archaeology. OK, they, can you, that's not very, why is that not very visible? Oh, sorry. That's the art of Constantine. <laughs> the isolation of monuments together with uh, the regime's dedication to grand exhibitions, was designed to turn the fascist land and cityscapes into a terrain perpetually on display. Uh, 
into a permanent spectacle of itself. This spectacle works, produces a reality effect because gestures of isolation work in tandem with gestures of integration and of dwelling. And is as in and as both, reclamation is a theory of ruination to the extent that it proposes the surge of the everyday as sublime ruination. Therefore, reclamation articulates the intersection of presence and absence as the site of dwelling in the shelter of isolation. Thesis five. Reclamation addresses a crisis in the logic of representation and all its significations. The crisis, this crisis expresses itself in two contradictory but nevertheless coexisting propositions. The first may be described as a radical refusal of all representation in favor of a logic of presentation, by which I intend a mechanism in the form of theatricality in and by which what is enacted is a desire for a sublimation or overcoming of representation in all its valences, aesthetic, political, and epistemological. At stake here is a presentation, even an acting out of what Lacan calls the real, and precisely not reality, which is why we are dealing here with utopian presentist desires. The affective effectiveness of projects of reclamation resides at least partially in this presented but unrepresentable pleasure. Reclamation produces, therefore, a short circuit between the event and its registration. A second logic is also in play, one I would call hyper-representation, for what is particularly arresting is that reclamation produces sites that are empty. Timothy Mitchell in Colonizing Egypt argues that such sites of representation are at the very core of colonialism. Colonialism refers not only to the domination of and over a territory by an exogenous entity, but also to a new way of conceptualizing time and space and a new way of manufact manufacturing the experience of the real. Colonialism constructs the world as an exhibition, as a representation. For this reason, it produces a world divided into two, not only between the West and its other, but also between representations and reality, things and plans." Quote from Mitchell. Colonialism was distinguished by its power of representation, whose paradigm was the architecture of the colonial city. The order and certainty of colonialism was the order of the exhibition. Modern politics was to reside within a reality effect, a technique of certainty, order, and truth by which the world seemed absolutely divided into self and other, into things themselves and their plan, into bodies and minds, into the material and the conceptual." End quote. In world exhibitions, museums, zoos, the architecture of cities, things increasingly appear to be built, organized, or consumed as signs of something else, while yet the, these signs evoke some more original and authentic idea of ex or experience. And yet, as Mitchell insists, there is no exit from this structure, as the authentic is lived in and as a perpetual deferral. Thesis six. Reclamation produces ruralization as the grounds for mediatic social life. It is a mediatic ruralism. It does this not as an ideological call back to the land or nature. Uh, that is the general reading about fascist ruralization policies. I think it's just wrong. Okay. The nature of reclamation is already one of supplementarity and displacement. Reclamation depends on an entirely modern project of planning and social engineering on the distinction between things and plans. Ruralization falls within the logic of reclamation under the purview of a making uh, under an urbanistics. Fascist urbanistics addressed itself as much to cities as to colonial settlements and to rural urbanism. Giuseppe Bottai envisioned urbanistica not only as identical to politics per se, Rural urbanistica, so he stated, and I quote, might appear to be a contradiction, but it is not, because it expresses precisely our objective of giving a new meaning to relations between the city and the function of the country, end quote. Therefore, the regime's reclamation involved the construction of a vast and capillary system of land divisions and settlements in a fight not only against volatile, moving, and nomadic lands, but, and right up the food chain, also against mobile waters, flying mosquitoes, roaming buffalo, and of course, erring humans. <laughs> 
beyond a hypothesized natural setting that from now on would be controlled by the work of pumps, tractors, disciplined labor, and hygienic living, Mussolini envisioned a sort of engineered geographical ecological project, one that could only be put into practice by the construction of an elaborate and hierarchical structure of settlement. In Italy, the project of in integral reclamation coincided with the creation of a nationally organized film industry. They were born exactly at the same time. The reclamation project and its filmic registration garnered not only equal amounts of capital investments, but also time in the sense of simultaneity. The new film industry not only covered the making of these new hybrid landscapes, it actively participated in their making. In a work of mutual support, the newly reclaimed lands and modern media inhabited a shared working space. Not coincidentally, Cinecittà, the Italian Hollywood, or uh, Cines, or Film City, and the new towns that were constructed by Mussolini were architecturally remarkably similar and were indeed conceived as models for each other. So this is one of the, uh, Mussolini's new towns, Pontinia, which these cities, by the way, uh, in the Pontine region, there are five of them, and they went up one a year. These entire cities were built. And this, of course, is uh, Cina Città. That's today. Um, uh, this is seven. Reclamation as mediatic ruralism is militarized, and this in several ways. For one, as a totalizing project, it comprehends all aspects of life, as, for example, in fascism's battle of the grain, the battle against bachelors, the demographic battle of births, and the defense of the atomic race. The latter was supported by the idea that population transfer into, into the uh, reclaimed regions and therefore cross-breeding between the variously imagined italic stocks would, like the reclamation of lands, produce a vigorous people strong enough for further colonial ventures. The workers sent to the Pontine region to drain the lands were depicted as soldiers or assault troops engaged with battling the malaria carrying mosquitoes, while the new settlers were to be imbued with colonial consciousness, one that combined military values with those pertaining organically to the land. Second, agriculture and war are conceived to be in an organic cyclical relationship. Agriculture begets war, and war in turn begets agriculture, all this in a natural change or cycle of times. Therefore, reclamation generates a sort of relay effect, whereby energies appear continuously displaced from war to agricultural and urban settlement and back again to war. These militarized features remain very visible today in many of the um, uh, museums dedicated to reclamation. I mean, they're curated in such a way that you sort of understand that you, know, that you move from agriculture and then that brings the war and then you know, there's a sort of cycle. Um, thesis eight, reclamation builds communities that are both closed and permeable. As Diane Girardo and Kurt Forster have pointed out, fascist reclamation projects build closed communities, and I quote, closed in a geometric sense at the level of urban planning and closed also to visitors as much as to their inhabitants. The plans for the cities and their respective rural settlements kept the farmers at a safe distance one from the other, as well as from the class of urban service employees. Through the creation of a deliberate power void and by preventing both the physical and institutional formation of local political organizations, the central authority was able to exercise a form of control that was more far-reaching than the one exercised by elites who were rooted in loco and who represented a broad range of interests, end quote. It is precisely the combination, conflation, or condensation of these two factors, closure and the strange power void, to co constitute an important driving principle of fascist reclamation project, projects, a principle, in fact, designed to uphold both the return to regionalism, hence the emphasis on closure, and yet also centralization, uh, and therefore permeability. The perfect symbol, or rather unifying symptom of this operation of condensation, is provided by the ubiquitous central tower erected in all of Mussolini's cities. So this is another one of the cities, and all of them have this tower. Uh, here, here's a poster for him. While recalling the tradition of campanilismo, that is the, the medieval tradition of building a city around a church steeple, right? 
Um, and while certainly representing thereby a historical continuity between a medieval then and a fascist now, and I quote uh, Girardo again, quote, the tower constitutes a symbol of power and a call to action, as well as a stage for the, uh, stage for the Duce's pompous self-presentation. It is the emblem of his figure, one that detaches itself from on high on the town hall, concretely and symbolically through the figure delegated to represent him. The gesture of the fascist salute corresponds to the gestural function of the tower, to affirm the unity of the people and its loyalty and obedience to the duce. The tower not only represents that ritual, but itself becomes ritual, a place of memory for power and order, the omnipresent and indestructible background of the duce's virtual presence." End quote. What is particularly striking is that this tower is indeed empty, Functional instead, not to a concrete message, but to a mediatic relay system. Mussolini's towers are in this sense more like the cell towers encountered throughout the world today, curiously often disguised as ruralizing trees. Okay. Um, in themselves, these towers signify precisely nothing, are in this sense voids of power. Instead, they have the function of relaying information at two, but not entirely contradictory uh, levels. On the one hand, the medium is the message, and on the other, a panoptical big brother is watching you. Okay, and this is my final thesis. Uh, reclamation constructs an authentic, even if authentic, even if anxious body through the combined application of two strategies, neorealist film and the elevation of the agricultural vehicle to the new mechanized and militarized subject of history. Um, this is a, um, one of, a drawing out of one of the newspapers. Okay, so again, the, tr the, the tractor here, it's very interesting because there is sort of a figure, but it's sort of, a, it's part of a machine. And this again, of course, is the fasces and it's plowing social democracy in the soil. The modest agricultural yet militarized tractor truck as it made its appearance in fascist neorealist film produced a specifically fascist reality effect by fueling its hermeneutic of re reclamation. Fascist culture reclamation was thus literally conveyed or transported by a truck. On the one hand, the regime supported traditional Italian culture in literature, in, in literature the visual arts, theater, and opera through the so-called thespian trucks that traveled throughout the peninsula to bring the classics of Italian theater and opera to all corners of the nation, near the thespian trucks. Um, on the other hand, fascism was grounded uh, in the notion of a vernacular language rooted in a thoroughly modernist soil. Indeed, it is precisely this modernist soil that provided the basis for fascist consent, I would argue. Its aesthetic relied on a spectator spectatorship as participant to the creation of a national culture to the extent that such viewers were to be precisely both external and yet also present. Uh, this is a very famous photograph. It's you know, reproduced all the time. It's the opening of Cinecittà in 1937. Mussolini is actually standing down somewhere on the right, but and then you have this enormous image of him, um, you know, sort of cut out on top. Uh, fascist neorealism, in this sense, set the stage for mass viewing as a form of participation. These masses, however, found their form of embodiment in the fascist imaginary, not as humans, but as a machine, but as machine made concrete in the agricultural military vehicle. Alessandro Blasetti, who was an important um, um, neorealist filmmaker, but his um, theater piece, 18BL, conceived as a grand theater project of the masses and for the masses, has as its central protagonist a truck, I kid you not, a single and collective personage, one described by Alessandro Pavolini as hard as the war of the struggles of the fascist squadrons and of building projects. The final act of the drama has the truck commit a kind of sacrificial suicide by letting itself be dumped into the swamps of the Pontine Marshes. All this again to confirm the close, even organic relationship between <coughs> agriculture and war. And apparently this is true. They really did dump a truck into the foundation of the city of Latina and it's still there today <laughs> under the central square. <laughs> Um, the Luce Institute, which is the, uh, the institu film institute in Italy to, that studies film but also makes um, 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 
um, newsreels and documentaries. So the Lucha Institute made countless documentaries of the reclamation in the Pantine region. And every time Mussolini visited the area, which he did all the time, this too was recorded on film. What is striking about these short films is the frequency in which the tractor appears as the main protagonist of the events being told. Um, this is from one film, this is from the, one, this is a really interesting film, but these are all tractors kind of marching ahead at us. The means by which the machine is anthropomorphized are quite subtle, however, for the tractor is not seen here directly to replace humans and animals. Instead, such, a, uh, such means affect an operation of displacement in such a way as to produce a, visual, a fluid visual language of natural machines or as machine nature. And so this is a famous poster. Um, heart and motor, state and party, ox and tractor, uh, in the project of reclamation, find them in themselves in a space of mutual support. So just to very conclude, I'll just put all these theses together into one compact little paragraph. Um, so reclamation proposes the tractor machine as a vehicle or medium. It does so by proposing a form of sociality that is both closed and permeable. It is military and agricultural. It proposes a notion of mediatic ruralism. It addresses the crisis of representation. It provides a theory of ruination as a way to confront the past. It makes landscapes. It challenges notions of nature as grounds for thinking. It literally drains grounds. And therefore, as I said at the beginning, as I proposed, reclamation I would see uh, propose as the conceptual grasp of the mediatic image in the process of being drained of its grounds. Thank you. Um, the uh, acoustics of this room are always uh, slightly uncanny, Maybe and I, I uh, don't know if you can hear me, uh, if this uh, echo chamber <laughs> is just too uncanny. I think there's, a, there's a text uh, circulating, and I'll be um, referring to this. And as Joan said, um, my uh, concept is inheritance, and I will develop this uh, concept vis-a-vis -a, -vis a specific text. Um, uh, Walter Benjamin's 1934 reading um, of Kafka. One encounters a strangely fascinating conceptual resistance when reading Walter Benjamin's sentences, an often unarticulated or absent figure of an elsewhere that is seldom set forth explicitly. They are, one senses, about what they seem to be about and yet always also about something else, a subterranean network that remains unnamed something whose thinkability often appears indebted to its very refusal to name. One way of engaging the politics of this elsewhere is to attend the numerous figures of non-synchronicity, temporal rupture, living on, and lateness that permeate Benjamin's words, figures, and thoughts. It may be here, rather than in his more canonical pronouncements, that is the orthodox core of Benjamin's writings that is so central to a multitude of intellectual fields today, um, that certain unexpected potentialities of his theoretical and political archive remain to be found. Among the themes that comprise what might be termed the language and logic of a certain afterness in Benjamin's thinking, the problem of intellectual and experiential inheritance, Erbe or Erbschaft, uh, stands out. It is no accident that in his 1937 essay on the cultural historian Eduard Fuchs, Benjamin refers to the note, quote, the notion of inheritance that is significant once again today, Begriff des Erbes, der auch heute wieder seine Bedeutung hat. To be sure, Benjamin is here thinking of the discourses of his time. Uh, among other things, the problem of inheritance in the afterlife of historical materialism as developed by Marx, Engels, and their successors, and the attendant question debated by Georg Lukacs, Ernst Bloch, Hans Eisler, and others, as to how to relate to a cultural intellectual inheritance that has been tainted by political appropriations and ideological deformations. 
Yet at the same time, a more general or structural engagement with the question of intellectual inheritance and its difficulties also is at stake. Benjamin wishes to begin to think inheritance as inheritance, that is, as a fundamental theoretical and political concept that leaves no part of an intellectual or artistic project and indeed no being in the world untouched. Um, this afternoon, I wish to read a single passage um, from Benjamin's 1934 essay on Kafka, first published in the Jüdische Rundschau under the title Franz Kafka zur zehnten Wiederkehr seines Todestages, Franz Kafka on the 10th anniversary of his death, with the question of inheritance in mind. That essay belongs to Benjamin's far-reaching network of engagements with the work of Kafka, which spans more than a decade. His texts include a review of Max Brod's Kafka biography, the lecture Kafka beim Bau der Chinesischen Mauer, various paraliponema, notes and sketches, as well as extensive epistolary exchanges on the topic of Kafka with his central intellectual interlocutors, Gershom Scholem, Theodor Adorno, Werner Kraft, Bertolt Brecht, and others. Among the first generation Frankfurt School thinkers' reception of Kafka, Benjamin's essay is genealogically situated between his friend Siegfried Krakauer's 1931 essay, Franz Kafka, published in the Frankfurter Zeitung, and Adorno's later essay, begun in 1942 and first published in 1953 in the Neue Rundschau, Notes on Kafka, Aufzeichnungen zu Kafka. It is my wager that learning how to read the language and logic of this single Benjaminian passage will help us learn how to inherit the strange singularity and idiomaticity of his movements of thought and writing more generally. In so doing, it will behoove us to resist the temptation to reduce Benjamin's language merely to this or that propositional content, a content that would be deaf to its own appearance in a particular linguistic formulation, and by extension indifferent to the unreliable workings of language as such. The passage in question is seldom remarked upon by Benjamin's commentators. This may be, in part, because the paratactical composition and conceptual elusiveness of the Kafka essay as a whole can seem like a refusal on the part of Benjamin um, to engage in textual exegesis at all. And so for readers such as the literary critic Robert Alter, who are perhaps too affirmatively convinced that Benjamin, along with Kafka and Scholem, quote, uh, perceived a sustaining power of visionary truth and an authenticity in Jewish tradition while fearing that this truth and this authenticity might no longer be accessible to them, unquote, what appears to him, odd, in quote, Benjamin's relation to exegesis is that he speculated about it, contemplated it as an ideal of writing and cognition without ever quite getting around to practicing it, unquote. Benjamin's remarkable essays on Kafka and others in Alter's view, quote, illustrate metaphysical speculations or historical generalizations, unquote, rather than, quote, setting texts for exposition through commentary, unquote. But one might object, what if Benjamin's um, seeming refusal to translate the multiple vagaries of Kafka's text into the treacherously stable idiom of achieved hermeneutic certainty were not merely an oddity or a shortcoming, but rather the very condition of possibility, possibility for any politically inflected attempt to do justice to the complexity of the problems that are at stake? That is to say, what if Benjamin's way of remaining faithful to Kafka's uneasy inheritance to Kafka as inheritance, consisted in his commitment to acknowledging as rigorously as possible the ways in which the questions that Kafka's texts pose, precisely in their own idiomatic terms, coax into being modes of reflection that lead ever more deeply into the complexity of the problems, that, um, of the problems they help us to, to articulate, rather than calling for responses that would undo the questions by providing alleged answers. Allowing oneself to be led ever more deeply into a problem rather than wishing to be guided out of it would then figure as a particular mode of inheriting a textual legacy in which the relation to what is inherited remains open and free that is unforeclosed by an heir's premature sense of ownership and seamless appropriation. Um, this refractory and resistant form of inheritance is staged in the first of the four parts of Benjamin's Kafka essay subtitled Potemkin. There, in the context of the ever-shifting constellation of reason, paternity, and justice in Kafka, Benjamin writes, and this is your handout, 
Der Vater, der der Strafende ist, ist zugleich auch der Ankläger. Die Sünde, deren er den Sohn bezichtigt, scheint eine Art Erbsünde zu sein. Denn wen trifft die Bestimmung, welche Kafka von ihr gegeben hat, mehr als den Sohn? Die Erbsünde, das alte Unrecht, das der Mensch begangen hat, besteht in dem Vorwurf, den der Mensch macht und von dem er nicht ablässt, dass ihm ein Unrecht geschehen ist, dass an ihm die Erbsünde begangen wurde. Wer aber wird dieser Erbsünde, der Sünde, einen Erben gemacht zu haben, bezichtigt, wenn nicht der Vater durch den Sohn? Somit wäre der Sündige der Sohn. Nicht aber darf man aus dem Satze Kafkas schließen, dass die Bezichtigung sündig sei, weil falsch. Nirgends steht bei Kafka, dass sie zu Unrecht erfolgt. And so the, the published English translation of the text renders this passage as follows. Fathers punish, but they are at the same time accusers. The sin of which they accuse their sons seem to be a kind of original sin. The definition of it which Kafka has given applies to the sons more than to anyone else. Original sin, the old injustice committed by man, consists in the complaint uneasy, unceasingly made by man that he has been um, the victim of an injustice, the victim of original sin. But who is accused of this inherited sin, the sin of having produced an heir, if not the father by the son? Accordingly, the son would be the sinner. But one must not conclude from Kafka's definition that the accusation is sinful because it is false. Nowhere does Kafka say that it was made wrongfully. Let us begin to approach this immensely rich passage by way of some preliminary observations. In Benjamin's original German, der Vater is singular, whereas in the published English translation, the singular noun turns into a plural one, fathers. But can there ever be more than one father? Who or what can have more than one father? The one. Who or what would authorize the transition from the one to the many? What are the conditions of the pluralized father? Likewise, Benjamin's der Sohn, singular, is rendered as sons, plural. This translation, not only between languages, but also between numbers, is justified to the extent that it is possible in German to employ a singular noun to speak of a plural concept, uh, especially when what is at stake is the universality uh, of a general structure or concept. The locutions der Vater and der Sohn therefore act as a stand-in for an implicit act but performed by die Väter and die Söhne, fathers and sons as such. Yet the singular designations of der Vater and der Sohn persists even in the universal locution, so that what survives within the general filial structure is precisely the idiomatic singularity of this particular father, Kafka's, and his particular son, Kafka himself, a singularity that may at times resist being subsumed under the universalizing category because it serves as an alleged example of it. Benjamin's specific hovering between singularity and universality here also pays homage to Kafka's own locution in his well-known Brief an den Vater, this text from um, 1919, uh, the long plaintive reckoning he addresses to his father, which perform, performs its own kind of hovering, that between der Vater, as the more objectified the father, and der Vater specified and personalized as my father. While the title of that text is usually translated as Letter to His Father, the translation can be misleading as it introduces the determinacy of a distance and a form of relation that is not to be found in Kafka's own language, a language that keeps suspended the relation between distance and proximity, the singularity of this particular father here and the exigencies of that father over there, which may not even be simply his or even mine. Kafka exploits the idiomatic German way of indicating one's proprietorial relationship to something or someone by employing the definite article an den rather than the possessive pronoun an meinen. In so doing, he situates his text precisely on the fence between an apostrophe directed at his father and one directed at fathers and fatherhood as such. Benjamin's and Kafka's indeterminate hovering between singularity and universality is erased in the English translation even though the latter is not technically incorrect. One might say that the English translation of Der Vater and Der Sohn inherits Benjamin's German precisely in a manner that trips over the internal resistance that its inheritance harbors. As such, it performs something of the operatic moment of inheriting 
that is at stake in the passage itself, becoming as it, against its own intention, as it were, a successful failure. To put it in an epi epigrammatically condensed way, it refuses or fails to fail merely unsuccessfully, that is, undialectically. The passage on Alpsünde that Benjamin quotes from Kafka appears as an entry um, dated November 15, 1920, in Notebook 12 of Kafka's Tagebücher, his diaries. It is also included in the prose collection beim Bau der Chinesischen Mauer. The particular relation that in Benjamin's reading of Kafka connects father and son is given the name Erbsünde. While the English translation provides the correct standard equivalent from the biblical tradition, original sin, different conceptualizations are implicitly operative in the German and the English terms. Original sin, like its German relatives Ursünde and Sündenfall, emphasizes an originary fall a departure from a previous course or state of affairs which subsequently, subsequently led to a fallen, that is, post-lapsarian world. Its reference is to the original sin narrated in the book of Genesis. After succumbing to the temptation to eat a fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in defiance of God's prohibition, which then becomes the primordial sin upon which all subsequent forms of sins are based. The, this moment of original sin, and especially its implications for language as such, always preoccupied Benjamin. For instance, in his 1916 essay on the philosophy of language, called On Language as Such and on the Language of Man, he evokes original sin, the Sündenfall, in terms of a double structure of decline and generativity in which, quote, the fall marks the birth hour of the human word. Der Sündenfall ist die Geburtsstunde des menschlichen Wortes. In which, name no long, in which name no longer lives intact and which has stepped out of name language, the language of knowledge." Unquote. According to the terms of the inheritance handed down by this scene of the fall, quote, after the promise of the snake, the word must communicate something, which is to say, something other than itself. Unquote. The Sündenfall thus forces an excessive relationship between word and world in the sense that the word is now forced to have a referential rather than a purely self-referential function at the same time that it inaugurates the tradition of human language itself, uh, that is, founds a legacy in which the human will be called upon to locate himself in the language into which he is always already born and to search for himself in a world of language that already precedes him and with whose ineluctable beforeness he must constantly strive to come to terms. Yet in the specific passage from the 1934 Kafka essay, the word in question is not Sündenfall, but precisely Erbsünde. The linguistic particularity of the term uh, that both Benjamin and Kafka employ here, which should be read carefully in its two parts as Erb, Sünde, shifts the emphasis from an originary act itself to the transmission and legacy of that act. Taken literally, Erbsünde means inheritance sin, ambivalently naming both the sin that is inherited and the sin of inheriting itself, that is, inheritance as sin. Erbsünde sets into motion an inheritance that becomes tradition, even if, or precisely when, its legacy is poisoned or has fallen ill. Seen from this perspective, it is no accident that Benjamin, in his long essay letter about Kafka to Scholem, uh, from June 1938, says that, quote, Kafka's work presents a sickness of tradition. Kafka's Werk stellt eine Erkrankung der Tradition dar, uh, unquote, um, and as such, concerns itself over and over again with the question of transmissibility, tradierbarkeit, tradierbarkeit. What is at stake is the very ability of something to be turned into a tradition, handed down, received by an heir, who in turn will perpetuate it by wrestling with it, interpreting it, and making it the touchstone of his own answerability to the difficulty of what has come before. It is worth noting that when Benjamin moves from the more circumscribed experience of tradition in Kafka's work to the larger questions of legacy and transmissibility that arise from it, he employs the term tradierbarkeit rather than merely tradition or tradition. And achieved, merely achieved reality or new state of affairs could even be thought to stand in the way of the open-ended and <coughs> unfulfilled nature of pure possibility, 
In the case of the problem of Trodirbarkeit in Kafka, we might say that, Ka that Benjamin focuses his attention not exclusively on the alleged content of this or that tradition, but rather on that content's capacity to be handed down. In other words, his focus is on the way in which a tradition becomes visible, visible and inheritable as tradition. From this perspective, the Tradirbarkeit of a legacy would seem to be in inextricably linked to a word that does not, not appear in Benjamin's lexicon, but whose logic and implications are nevertheless present everywhere, that is, Erbbarkeit, inheritability. If a tradition has fallen ill, thereby evoking questions of legacy, genealogy, transmission, and legibility under an altered sign, then specific elements that inhabit this tradition would have to be reread in light of the shifting relations among those elements within the space of time and time of the legacy in which they occur. It is no different in the particular relation of the legacy or tradition connecting father and son. After all, it too is struck in Kafka by a particular Erkrankung. Between father and son, there obtains a paradoxical relation, one mediated by the inheritance of an Erbsünde. The father, who enacts the double role of plaintiff and punisher, accuses the son of an Erbsünde. Here, the very sin of producing an Erbe, an heir, even though he himself is the originator of that sin, and therefore the one who passes on the legacy of an inheritance. But according to Kafka's logic of inheritance, the Erbsünde consists not in having committed an original sin, but rather in assuming that a sin has been committed against one. That is, that a self has suffered an injustice that has been inflicted upon it. This particular form of injustice is itself the Erbsünde because it mistakes the tacit genealogy of a perceived injustice with its interpretation or misinterpretation as a matter of lived experience. For Benjamin, if this paradoxical logic of inheritance can be thought in the context of the relation between father and son, then the one who has committed the Erbsünde is in fact the son, not the father. As he says, somit wäre der Sündige der Sohn. The sin would then consist in having inherited a misinterpretation of one's own suffering and of having persisted in that misinterpretation. The precise terms of Erbsünde in Benjamin's reading of Kafka could then be formalized as follows. Die Sünde geerbt zu haben, to have inherited sin, becomes die Sünde geerbt zu haben, the sin of having inherited, a fundamental difference uh, marked by the presence or absence of a mere comma. The law at work in this logic pertains to the politics of a legacy, tradition, reception, in short, what could be called the law of the Erbe. Inheriting something Finding oneself the heir of a legacy one does not fully understand requires opening up to the difficulty of that legacy, its suspension between legibility and illegibility. This act of inheriting also calls upon the heir to acknowledge that the difficulty of uh, the inheritance itself, rather than the one who hands it down, is responsible for the burden it has placed upon the one who inherits. The uneasy, even ghostly task of inheriting is precisely to learn to confront, engage, and ceaselessly interpret this burden, inviting the difficulty of the inheritance as inheritance, rather than attempting to circumvent it through a supposedly seamless act of appropriation. Just as Benjamin through Kafka, in a move that on the surface appears paradoxical, suggests that the sin of the Erbsünde may not lie with the father, but in actuality with the son who inherits the father's legacy, so the quote-unquote sin of inheriting is to be negotiated not with a focus uh, on the one who or that which uh, bestows an inheritance, but rather with a focus on how the inheritor as the recipient of a tradition that emanates from elsewhere relates to that inheritance. That is how well he learns to struggle with its competing meanings and unfathomable implications. In the case of the Erbsünde that structures the relation between father and son in Kafka, and that between Kafka and his heir, Benjamin, what imposes itself on consciousness is not only a responsibility toward the ways in which the inheritance offers itself to interpretation while simultaneously withdrawing from it, but also a certain kind of orphanhood, a becoming orphan. The one who inherits becomes an orphan. This is not this is so not only because an inheritance is typically 
um, uh, bequeathed in the case of a parent's guardians or elders prior death, in short, the death of the other, but also because the price that is paid for inheriting something, including an intellectual or immaterial legacy, is to be thrown in the condition of having been left behind, a scene of departure and leave-taking, mourning and the experience of becoming literally or figuratively orphaned. No inheritance without orphans. Indeed, the primal scene of the Alpsinde, which in the biblical tradition is believed to have set into motion the perpetual sinfulness of humankind into which one is born, is inexorably tied to the scene of Adam and Eve's abandonment, the moment in which they are permanently expelled from the Garden of Eden by their creator. It is striking to note, therefore, that the etymology of the German word Erbe encrypts something of the history of this process of becoming an orphan. Indeed, the history of Erbe is inseparable from that of the orphan. The origin of the term, which can be documented in early Germanic and Celtic sources, in Old High German was Erbi, and in Middle High German Erbe, which is genetically related to the Gothic Arbi and the Old English Irfi. It is primordially linked, and the Duden etymology speaks here of Urverwand, Urverwand, primordially linked um, with the Old Irish Orbe and the Latin Orbes, meaning robbed, the Greek Orphanos, the orphaned, orphaned, and Armenian Orb, also orphan. These and related form formations derive from the Indo-European root Orbo, orphaned or orphan. Therefore, it can be argued that the original meaning of Alba is orphaned possession, or possession of the orphan. In the orbit of this same etymological root, one finds the ancestors of the German word for work, that is, Arbeit, um, which ori originally signified, quote, the hard physical labor of an orphaned child. And if you look at the, uh, at, at the Grimm's Dictionary at Duden, uh, it's the hard physical labor of an orphaned child. Um, and the German word for poor, arm, uh, which, one, uh, which once signified orphaned. Hmm? If Erbe is always suffused with a form of orphanhood, as the Indo-European Orbo suggests, then an inheritance can always also be thought as a form of becoming orphaned. What is passed on and what is inherited are always also orphaned goods. But if the orphaned goods of an inheritance are associated with the hard labor of an orphan, an orphan's arbeit, they also evoke the hard, slow, patient, and questioning labor of reading, that is, the laborious process of opening up to receiving the language and objects of the other who passes on a legacy. There can be no inheritance in the strong sense of the concept without this labor of orphanhood, without shouldering the burden of a rigorous reading and vigilant reinterpretation. To the extent that Erben and Erbschaft are etymologically linked to the labor, Arbeit, and poverty, Armut, of an orphaned child who emerges as something akin to a serf, the moment of inheritance is touched in its Sisyphean despair by a certain morning. It is no accident that the Old High German Erbi and the Middle High German Erbe are not only related to the Anglo-Saxon Erbe and Middle Low German Erbe, but significantly also to the Old Norse Erfi, which names a funeral reception or commemoration of the departed. In the latter sense of Erfi, an inheritance always also gathers around death, uh, around death and finitude, the unrepresentable experience of life as death-oriented and resistant to interpretation. The history of language, at least in the German case of the Albert that is at stake in Benjamin's inheritance of Kafka, preserves something of the abiding, of the, of it, of the abiding interpenetration that is not usually visible on the surface, but that forever joins an inheritance with a funeral reception, welding the work of mourning, even the hard labor or arbeit of a rigorous textual encounter with a logic and a language that are seen only in their withdrawal and understood only as distant echoes of a time and a thinking that, that already are no more. One of the many precepts that follow from assuming this perspective is that the son must learn to recognize himself as an inheritor in mourning who is called upon to engage the difficult labor of learning to read the inheritance. He must grasp, in other words, that the inheritance, far from being an appropriable possession, is precisely this mournful process of reading and interpreting. Uh, 
akin to the lessons um, that the man from the country must also learn uh, in before the law, that the law is not ultimately something to be entered. As such, the son is both son to his father and at the same time, in the moment of recognizing the demands placed upon him by the mournful inheritance and its perpetual and properly indeterminable interpretation, inter interpretation also as orphan. According to this logic, we might say that the son is always a, already an actual or future orphan, regardless of whether his father is in fact alive or dead. One way of glossing the Erbsündem that circulates through Kafka's language, as well as through Benjamin's inheritance of it, is to prepare the scene for an albeit deferred understanding, a distant intimation of the orphanhood that the inheritance calls into being. Yet even this perceived orphanhood can never become a matter of mere possession. It can only be thought and shared to the extent that it refuses to be fully possessed, that is to the extent that it eludes the illusions bestowed upon us by our often premature sense of ownership of this or that experience. This way of thinking complicates our understanding um, of Max Brod's refusal to enact a particular mode of inheriting, that is, Kafka's testamentary wish to see uh, his manuscripts destroyed um, after his death, um, a, a way of relating to Kafka's legacy to which Benjamin also um, devoted a short text uh, from 1929 uh, called Cavaliers Moral. The problem of inheritance emerges as a fourth field of differences and deferrals that is lodged at the core of the spectral logic and afterlife of legacy, because no inheritance can be thought without finitude, a shared finitude that binds itself to the other. The thought of inheritance also must confront a double obligation to the inheritance itself, that is, its content, and to the very finitude whose horizon first makes the act of inheriting possible. The paradoxical inheritance that is named by the Erbsünde and that is passed on through the relation between father and son, or parent and orphan, uh, cannot but confront the demand that it be read and reread, reinterpreted, and thus reinherited always one more time. Following Benjamin inheriting Kafka means inviting the simultaneous necessity and impossibility of a legacy without attempting merely to disinherit the contingencies and resistances that such a tradition hands down to us. On the contrary, inheriting would mean uh, receiving precisely the singular demand of an answerability for which there can be no stable ground and which, as in Benjamin's radically political assessment of post-Lapsarian modernity uh, in the Trauerspiel book, the heir must confront the permanent threat posed by the insight that, and this is from the um, Trauerspiel book, that, quote, any person, any object, any relationship can mean absolutely anything else. Jede Person, jedwedes Ding, jedes Verhältnis kann ein beliebiges anderes bedeuten. That, in essence, is the, the, um, the predicament of modernity. That's, uh, that's, the, that's one of the, the absolute that has been handed down to us. Um, it is here, in the space of this double possibility, forever linking the politics of a certain disclosure uh, to its retreat, that a reluctant yet receptive heir may begin to receive the legacy of a future based on the unending interpretation of an inheritance that has not been decided once and for all, but instead lingers as an open question. To refuse this uneasy legacy would be to foreclose the act of inheriting itself. Indeed, it would constitute another kind of Erbsünde. Thank you. So first question about fascism, um, can, can, we, uh, can we reclaim the argument out of the specific context of fascism, which is to ask, um, is, is everything we heard here, is a fascinating thesis, uh, specifically true to the context of fascism, or is it also that we can find this in, <clears throat> I would say in general, the modern uh, utopian political imaginary, so certainly in the uh, 
Soviet Union, but you could also say in, in the United States and elsewhere. And coming from Israel, some of these pictures look very similar, especially the tractors and things like that. Very strong aesthetics. <clears throat> um, and a couple of questions to, uh, to the Benjamin lecture. Um, the f first, um, I think there were two sort of um, movements uh, that I, I'm not sure were warranted in what you said. So first, uh, you were talking at certain point about uh, parents, and the text is specifically about a father, not about a mother. So do we also inherit uh, from the mother in the same sense? That would be the first question. The second question is you spoke about uh, legacy. You connected legacy with the political. But what legacy is there in this passage? There's, there's only uh, sin and guilt. Um, so unless I missed something, if you could explain how exactly, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is uh, Kafka inheriting a legacy from his father as well? <laughs> um, absolutely. And it's not limited to fascism. And, and, um, the Soviet Union is a very good example. The American New Deal, Israel, um, I think many forms of settler colonialism definitely fall um, into that category. So I, I would put it together with various forms of settler colonialism, but I think it's also broader. Um, the, the, um, than just the colonial, but um, the, the, the one thing that, I'm sorry, what? I, can't, I didn't hear what you said. Hollywood in the United States. Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, that, I, I don't know how I want to answer that. Um, I mean, I think not all of Hollywood, but certainly certain forms of, I'm thinking of, you know, certain forms of populism you know, in the 30s, Frank Capra and people like that, possibly, but I, I wouldn't want to commit to that. Um, the, the, the reason I'm focusing in on fascism rather than, let's say, um, other areas is because, well, because I work on Italy, but, but because um, uh, the, people are going to get very annoyed when I publish this in Italy because it, well, because I'm actually making claims about consent, you know, consent structures and fascism when I'm talking about vernacular, you know, sort of a vernacular fascism. Um, and I think that's because of the idea that it's a totalitarian culture that it imposes from, from above. And I'm trying to think about something else. So. Um, I think what you, um, what you see in this, um, in this passage, on the one hand, is a particular it's, 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 the, it's a particular kind of relationship to uh, a particular kind of inheritance. It would be, in that case, the, the inheritance of sin and guilt. Uh, that's true, but there's something uh, structural in this passage that interested me. There's something um, that performs um, a certain lo logic of transmission, a certain uh, logic of uh, legacy and handing down. Um, that Benjamin is so concerned with, and that that all oh, that that transcends um, the uh, the particular confines of the uh, of the Kafka. I mean, it has to travel through that particularity. It has to, with Benjamin, it always has to travel uh, through some kind of specificity and singularity um, before it opens up onto a much broader uh, a general structure. And that's, um, um, I think, um, what can be retraced here. As far as the parents are concerned, yes. I mean, for Kafka, it's uh, primarily the father. It's not Brief an die Mutter or something like this. <laughs> it's always letter to his father and so on. Um, and this is what, uh, what Benjamin uh, quotes here. Nevertheless, if you look at um, what can be derived, uh, what can be uh, extended from the logic uh, of fatherhood um, uh, uh, to the very logic of a, of, a, of a filial relation. I mean, I would, uh, I would also include, uh, I would include the mother, I would include the dead uncle, uh, ultimately, I would include the dead or potentially dead other as such. Uh, and uh, I think, um, I think that's, um, that's the kind of relation uh, 
um, toward an, um, you know, uh, uh, a real or anticipated mourning um, that the relationship between her, uh, heir and the one who bestows an inheritance always al uh, also has to confront. So um, that's, that's what I would say. Um, inheritance, inheritance, often or always, I don't know, uh, involves wheel, right? A wheel, a wheel, no, will, will. Yeah. And my question is, so I have two questions here. Uh, one for you, and one for Suzanne on on. on different aspect. What, so the first question is whether it is possible to imagine, no, excuse me, how do you understand the will of the sun in inheritance? Can the sun, if, I mean, I'm playing with will here, of course, uh, can the sun uh, refuse to inherit? And isn't not the whole uh, argument depends on the wheel of the sun. If the sun has a wheel uh, and he can exercise the wheel, and if the sinful uh, thing is the, in the inheritance itself, then the refusal of the wheel is, is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. and, and to Suzanne, I, is, is, it, is it true that, we, uh, that to reclaim is to reclaim that which has not, which has not been inherited? And I, I'm asking this uh, not just in order to make the connection, which is always surprising between two uh, concepts, uh, and, but because in Hebrew, there is a word uh, that is uh, to inherit, that is used in biblical Hebrew in a specific context, which can be understood as reclaiming that which has not been inherited. Uh, the people of Israel come to inherit the land, la reshet et aretz, and and this is the moment in which they take the land, and they reclaim it. It is it was promised to them. They reclaim it. It's now it's theirs, uh, but of course, they they have never inherited it. Um. I suppose, in theory, it should be possible uh, not to accept an inheritance. Um, but yet, in a strong sense, uh, or in the sense in which you, say, interrogate a certain kind of relationship to, to legacy, even refusing an inheritance is a form of inheritance. Because in order to, to, to reject an inheritance, to refuse it, I have to have looked at it, I have to have read it, I have to have dealt with it. I, I must know what it is that, that it's coming to me. Um, and uh, so I don't see, I, I wouldn't um, insist on the absolute binary opposition between accepting and inheriting. Uh, it, is, uh, it is rather a matter of formulating the relationship uh, um, of, of what comes. Uh, um, that that may that may determine that may determine me, or that may de determine, let's say, my intellectual project. In the case of intellectual history, um, perhaps much more so uh, in cases where I, where I don't wish to inherit. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, I find myself in in a place and in a position uh, that is already completely saturated by its own genealogies, uh, legacies. Uh, words, uh, languages, and so on. Um, so that that refusal, um, yeah, it may, it may be there on a, on a superficial cognitive level, but the inheritance is already what makes me who I am. Um, so that's, uh, and I, I think that's um, that's one of the uh, the the, the th it's one of the modes of thinking inheritance that connects Kafka to Benjamin. What do you do with this with this, this un uneasy, this monstrous legacy? Um, that you can't simply accept or reject. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and perhaps accepting it uh, is just as monstrous because you don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to live up to it, how to read it, how to interpret it. Because if, if, the, if, the, um, if the transparency of that legacy were given, if you understood it, there would be nothing to inherit, and not in a strong sense. <laughs> 
would just say, okay, I'm going to take it, I'm going to go home. And, mm. uh, but it's especially in that, in that, in that uh, inability or perhaps that refusal to, to inherit that I experience inheritance as, as an actual problem and perhaps as a, as, a, as a philosophical problem as well. So refusal would be a mode of inheritance? It would, yeah. Refusal to inherit would be one of the modes of inheriting. I forget who else is, like yeah. Benjamin, sharing the problem of rejecting yeah. this German inheritance, yeah. right? Which I take it was a political, uh, at least in Benjamin, uh, yeah. would po political. But now it turns out that, that, in your view, that opposition, it can't happen. It can't happen. It can't happen. It can't. So the politics of inheritance is impossible. There is no politics of inheritance. Mm, I would say the opposite. I would say there is only politics of inheritance. Right. Phil, there's only politics of inheritance. Because <laughs> it is precisely in that moment, um, let's say these, I mean, these writers here, first generation Frankfurt School, let's say, um, inheriting a certain German philosophical tradition. You alluded in your paper to the history of German aesthetic theory. Uh, um, that, that has become tainted, uh, that has become a question mark, that has become problematic. Um, but um, it leads me to a point where uh, my, my thinking registers a certain residual attachment to the very thing that my thinking hopes to overcome or detach itself from. So in other words, Benjamin would say, you know, even by problematizing, uh, calling into question certain elements of a certain canonical, let's say philosophical uh, tradition, requires me to employ precisely the conceptual apparatus that has come out of this tradition. And therefore, I can never have quite just separated from it or departed from it. Um, and uh, so I think you could argue that this is an eminently political moment, at the, the moment at which you cannot decide um, whether your particular act of inheriting something is a break from that which you inherit, you could say a refusal to inherit, or a perpetuation of it uh, under a different sign. And, uh, and so, so that, that, you could say, is, a, is precisely a political relation to an intellectual tradition, to, 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 to the genealogy of thought itself. No? Can I just quickly respond to, to um, this question? Yeah. No, I think it's a really interesting question. And, you know, I think that um, it, um, it, it's almost as if there's a deliberate not answer to that. I mean, it has to, it seems to me, be both. They have to, in other words, the claim has to be both, yes, we inherit this land, while at the same time it is, well, that is not ours and it's only by, you know, kind of this sort of radical remaking, right? So there's this, it's both this kind of, you know, a, a refusal and, and, a, and, a, and a radical refusal and a radical acceptance, which is part of, you know, what I was getting at with this nature business, right? So it's, 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 it is back to nature at some level, but it's also this radical refusal of it. And so therefore the relationship to, to you know, we inherit the land, you know, of Israel, or, um, um, it would seem to me, um, it, it speaks in this rhetoric of a kind of, you know, of a, of a natural inheritance, and yet I think it's a very sort of similar um, uh, kind of paradox or apparatic structure within that, because it has to also re reject it, and I think that's sort of close to what you're getting at, I think, um, in, in the kind of politics of Ref refusing to inherit and but also inheriting. You see that you place for a while, but you, I come back to you eventually, right? Uh, Ravid, please, us, and then Elizabeth, did you have your no? Did someone else over there? Oh, oh Jacques, there. Yeah. And um, who else? And, and Tim. Tim. Uh, thank you, first. Uh, these were really lovely papers, and, and I'm drawn, so first it's sort of a, a, a comment or an invitation to, to think the concepts together, and then I have a brief question for, for each of you, but, um, but I, I found really compelling, really um, in, intriguing the connections between in inheritance and reclamation, right? It, um, and thinking about that in terms of a kind of directionality, a directionality of a narrative. So, 
inheritance first and foremost seems to be based on some kind of a reception, right? Whether or not one refuses to take that reception, you know, something being passed along, being transmitted, right? At the transmissibility that you spoke of. In reclamation, right, there seems to be a kind of twisting on the idea of inheritance, right? A kind of, I mean, I think in the way that Adi was speaking about it in, 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 in to, to, to go and actively take something and then claim it as an inheritance, right? As opposed yeah, to having right. been bequeathed it. Um, so I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just curious to kind of collectively even spin out the implications of thinking these concepts together, even though, um, uh, you know, I, in, in spite of some, some very clear differences. Um, the, the other, the, the, so the question I had for Suzanne is, is um, the, which you kind of pose as a question yourself, so I feel like I can ask it, is the question of literary realism, right? Because of course, um, when you say on one hand that, that, that it's most, it seems most deeply, that, that, that reclamation seems most connected to or, or uh, closest to, to literary realism, I, I, I wonder why that's the case if it also, as you say in the fifth thesis, uh, fifth thesis addresses a crisis in the logic of representation, yeah. right, which seems to be quite other than realism to me. Right, so I'm just wondering about, I, I just want to hear a bit more about why literary you know, realism as the kind of next of kin or in, in some way. Um, and, uh, and, and for, for Gerhard, I, 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 really, um, I really like the comments, the kind of separation that, that you draw between inheritance and ownership, right? And, and your claims about the premature sense of ownership, which I, I, I'm entirely in agreement with, um, but I still come back in a kind of legal sense a little bit to the fact that inheritance and ownership are in some ways, you know, are, are contingent concepts, right? When one inherits, one is always already an owner, at least in that particular context. So you're uncoupling it from a certain context, the context of law perhaps, right? In which um, ownership and inheritance are contiguous at the very least, right? Um, but here you place it in, in a kind of, what I start to think of as a kind of affective terrain in which inheritance is the a priori condition, right, um, toward feeling a sense of ownership. And if one feels a sense of ownership prematurely, then what one feels ultimately is a sense, a sense of entitlement. I mean, I'm, I'm just curious about problematizing ownership further uh, even. I mean, you know, because it, it, it comes up so briefly, but it seems to me a key concept in, in the way that you formulate inheritance as the part that's transmissible and ownership that comes afterward that seems to be something that one must earn rather than someone, something to which one is entitled. Again, which just lexically and conceptually anyway yeah. separates it from yeah. uh, the legal register at least. Yes, I mean certainly there are legal situations in which these questions of inheritance are um, uh, or they appear to be much clearer uh, and uh, that, that's quite true and what I have in mind here uh, of course, uh, uh, questions of an intellectual inheritance. Uh, of, uh, in other words, um, a kind of inheritance that allows me to relate not just to this or that manifestation of an inheritance, but to inheritance as such. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's at the moment at which I recognize myself as a, as a, as a, inheriting being, that's something like that. Uh, and there's a nice passage in Heidegger where he says, um, der Mensch ist derjenige, der erbt. So the human being is the one who inherits. <laughs> um, that goes very much um, in, in, uh, in that direction. And it's, um, uh, it's through, that, uh, through that uncertainty of the inheritance that that even with the best of intentions or with, with, with the best of um, uh, legal procedures, I can't quite circumvent. So for instance, I mean, to go back to, to Heidegger's example, uh, so when Heidegger, I don't know, uh, claims um, that he wants to overcome Western metaphysics, you know, that, that mm -hmm. philosophy comes to an end, and now finally Denken begins, you know, the end of philosophy and the task of thinking and so on. You know, why have we done so much and said so much and thought so little? I mean, why haven't we begun to think, he says so often. Um, and there, there's a sense in which 
mm, you can't just outsmart metaphysics or the history of philosophy, the, the history of everything that has made your thinking possible, even as you turn against or especially as you turn against it, because your turn against it or your, <laughs> your refusal of it or your rewriting of it, your critique of it, um, to the extent that it can be uh, effective uh, and powerful, um, uh, must take the very terms uh, of that which it hopes to overcome as its condition of possibility and therefore remains attached to it, that, which is to say it keeps, it keeps inheriting it uh, in, in very particular ways. And so, uh, so yes, so, but there, you're right, I mean, there are other forms of you know, legal inheritance. For the, for the law, it's perhaps less of an issue. Um, there are other discourses of inheritance um, that would push us into other uh, realms of this experience. Uh, think of biological inheritance, something that is inherited in your genes, mm -hmm. that you don't, that is coming your way, more or less, and you know it or not, but it's in you already, it's operative, it, it's this other that's doing things in you. Uh, a certain illness that is going to come or that runs in your family and so oh, what not that that's also a form of biological inheritance that would open up to a question of biopolitics and uh, and so forth um, but i think we're dealing here with a with an intellectual or philosophical uh, inheritance i want to hear suzanne's response <laughs> The, I know. Next time I'm going to answer first, okay? <laughs> now, you know, the, the, the realism question, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I mean, it's possible that the better term would, in fact, be naturalism and, and, um, and not realism. And, and the, so that's one possibility. And, and uh, I mean, I've been working, you know, mostly with the Italian version of that, and that is verismo, and that might be closer to, more, you know, naturalism than, than not. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, and, and this may be due the, to the fact that I've been spending a lot of time with Fred Jameson's Antinomies of Realism recently, and I just think it's a fantastic book, and um, uh, because I, I think he's describing something about this this kind of tension between you know the narrative drive and the descriptive drive, and, I, and there's something I think going on in the in the ways in which reclamation is conveyed and and in in the, in the mediatic sense that is to me very similar. Um, in other words, there is this both the 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 idea of um, and this is partly related to the inheritance you know, question um, of um, both describing something as in, in its isness, while at the same time, you know, it, it is always already there. And um, while at the same time, there is this pull towards the, you know, a destiny or something. So, so and, and that's where the reclaiming, you know, also has to come in. So it's both there and something that needs to be changed. And, and so I see those kinds of things going on in, in so that's. Oh, uh, no, just a question uh, to, to Susan. If you can, uh, if you can precise a bit, you know, your notion of vernacular, you know, because I not, I don't exactly understand, you know, the relation you make between, uh, well, reclamation and the vernacular, you know, because of course I see, you know, well, what I see, you know, in what you, you presented, you know, is well those kinds of uh, revival or revival of uh, Roman architecture, medieval architecture, more or less, in fact, mediated by metaphysical painting, you know, also, and so uh, a kind of modern reinterpretation you know, of the history of the nation. Uh, to what extent can we call it vernacular, you know? But uh, no, I, I have a problem because, you know, I'm, I was thinking, you know, uh, of, you know, there is a European country now where is, there is a kind of uh, uh, crazy dream, you know, uh, of recreating the national past, which is Macedonia, you know. And, 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 and there is Skopje, you know, where with this kind of monumental, you know, town, you know, which is supposed to, to revive or to reclaim, in, in a sense, you know the past glory of Macedonia. Uh, it can hardly be called vernacular, you know, the kind of architecture that, that, that they make. So that was my question, you know, what, I understand why you, you choose, you know, vernacular, as you, as you told, you know, to, to oppose the idea of fascism as something just coming from above. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, is it really what is usually thought, you know, under the term of vernacular? 
Yeah, I'm actually not, I'm actually distinguishing the vernacular architecture uh, from the Roman architecture, you know, the Romanist part. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, in the history that are written of Italian fascist architecture, the emphasis is entirely on the Romanist style, right? To some degree, you know, there's an, 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 um, interest in the, the retrieval of certain kind of medieval uh, forms, but overall, you know, it's overwhelming. And if, you know, if we think about the big pieces of, you know, of architecture, uh, you know, the, what we would recognize as fascist architecture, it's that. It's the sort of the neoclassical Romanist style. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something else. And, uh, and, and what's interesting is that that tradition in the construction of the built environment for, you know, 20 years, you know, from 1922 to 43, is in, in these histories completely ignored. And yet it's extremely important. Um, and uh, so that the, the ways in which the cities, um, the, the, the lands are reclaimed, they're drained, you know, and, 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 and um, um, canals are built and all that, and then these, these farmhouses and settlements, <coughs> Uh, and then towns are built. They are deliberately built, I think, not in that in, in the Romanist grand style, but in something completely, you know, sort of a modest um, you know, in vernacular architecture. And so I'm, I've been asking myself why that is being completely left out in the narrative. And I think that the reason for that is is exactly that it raises political, historical, historiographical issues that certainly in the Italian context, uh, historians of fascism don't want to. I've not wanted to look at, and that had to do, it has, I think, to do with this, the consent question. Um, so that, that's why I've been, you know, I turn to these, to these reclamation projects. There's another part, by the way, in that, which is, I don't know if this is relevant, but um, it is, it is the, that vernacular movement, while not historicized and, you know, and, and overtly thematized, has, however, sort of quietly you know, one sort of whispers, well, that's what Mussolini was successful at, is, is, what, is what is being said. So. I think this will be the last question, so, Tim. Do we have yeah. time? Yeah. Okay, um, okay well, I, I guess it's a, well, I have questions for both of you, but I'm only gonna ask the question for Gerhard, which is, um, and it's large enough, in fact. Um, uh, and, and the passage that I was thinking of, uh, uh, many moments in your very interesting talk, is actually from the other text by Benjamin on Kafka, at least the other text that is widely known in, in English on, on Kafka, which is the letter to Sholem. And it's the, another dense passage where he's talking about the relationship between, uh, of Kafka to the Haggadah and the Halakha. And he says, Kafka's text uh, forsake truth for the sake of its transmissibility. And that, I, so I, I wondered if you would, um, uh, if you had any thoughts about that very equally rich and, and I'm sure equally dense and difficult passage in the, in the German. Um, and that, that question, and what, what the reason why I wanted to ask it was because of actually something that you said in response to another question. Um, you know, if you understood it, there would be nothing to inherit. In other words, there's this deeply sort of complex relationship to meaning, to transmiss transmissibility, uh, to, well, deeply complex relationship, paradoxical relationship to meaning mm -hmm. on the one hand and its transmissibility on the other. That I, it seems to me that this, this whole um, exploration of the uh, relationship between original sin and, and transmission and inheritance also is getting at. Um, but, of course, this other passage re refers to, in Benjamin's reading, to the very capacity of, tr uh, of truth in uh, Kafka's text. Uh, yeah, thank you for this, um, Tim. Um, I mean, this, um, the transmissibility passage in the so-called letter to Sholem, <laughs> which is another essay. <laughs> Um, on Kafka um, uh, problematizes tradierbarkeit, right? uh, and something is sacrificed. We hear uh, for this transmiss for the sake of transmissibility. Um, um, what I, I think, what I also want to hear in, in, in tradierbarkeit and in this transmissibility, 
um, is that um, is that strange um, a relationship that Benjamin has to the inheritance of German, the German that he inherits, where he often will, found, will, will form these compound nouns with Barkeit, some form of ability, transmissibility, sightability, um, and so on and so forth. Transmissibility, uh, there's a book by Sam Weber on this, on this problem called Benjamin's Abilities and so on, where he's a thought about this, this, this strange moment in Benjamin reproducibility in, 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 the, in the artwork essay and so on, where it seems that this, um, uh, that, that, that this is not some stylistic idiosyncrasy in Benjamin, uh, but that something serious is at stake here, where he is interested in trying to preserve um, something like the potentiality uh, of a concept uh, that exists and that does, that does its, its work, um, regardless of whether uh, what it what it denotes is ever is is ever actualized, um, and uh, and so and I would say even though transmissibility or tradierbarkeit uh, doesn't come up in in, in, in Weber's book, I think uh, uh, you might begin to to place transmissibility precisely uh, into that into that constellation, because. Um, you know, politically, you might also relate this to um, the, uh, the thesis of the philosophy of history uh, and certain moments in the Arcades Project and so on, uh, where he says, um, you know, the, the fact that things keep going on like this, that's the catastrophe. The catastrophe is not something that flew in through the window one fine morning uh, or that, you know, that fa German fascism came in through the window one fine morning, you know. Um, the fact uh, uh, that... Um, things get inherited in a certain way, <laughs> which is to say blindly, which is to say undialectically, which is to say unproblematically, and that's the implicit and uh, secret catastrophe of a kind of political inheritance. Um, so, on the one hand, you might say, well, there's a certain sacrifice of truth on the altar of transmissibility as inheritance, um, but, uh, and this may be, um, but at the same time, um, this kind of sacrifice, if you want to call it that, opens up the possibility, or the thinkability at least, of a disruption of the kind of transmission and reception that he names catastrophe. Um, you know, and when he when he when he writes these lines in the Arcades Project, you know, it's very apodictic, it's epigrammatic, and he doesn't tell us well what might that mean to interrupt that uh, that kind of transmission. Um, but it's precisely in these, in these other places where you would least expect it, that don't, sound that don't seem political at all, when he reads Kafka, or uh, when he worries about film, when he's interested in photography, all these other displaced um, legacies and inheritances uh, to which he relates, that that kind of um, interruptibility uh, of historical catastrophe becomes perhaps not actual, but at least thinkable. And, uh, and so that, that's, um, I think that was one of the motivation for trying to think along the lines of these few sentences here, if that makes sense. So. Yeah. Other speakers?